Father in heaven, as we open your word today, speak to our hearts, speak through me, and may your Holy Spirit impress upon us that which we need to hear. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In Revelation 13, verse 8, it's a familiar text to many of us. It's a text that kind of goes to the very beginning of the plan of redemption, for we're told in Revelation 13, verse 8, it talks about the Lamb. In the midst of talking about the two beasts of Revelation 13 and what we know is the papacy in the United States of America, in the midst of talking about all of that, it talks about the Lamb. And it says that the Lamb is slain or killed from the when? the foundation of the world. And that text is just kind of put there in the middle of this chapter about beasts, this chapter about the mark of the beast and the number of the beast and the image of the beast. We've got this phrase there where it says, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Which then kind of becomes this recurring theme and this recurring uh, point that you find throughout the Old Testament and throughout the Gospels. You never shake that. I mean, even though that's written in Revelation, it's the foundation of the world. And from whenever that, 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 that statement was true, all the way through, you just have this recurring theme. Israel is pointing forward. Israel is pointing forward. The prophets are pointing forward. The prophetic word is all pointing forward to this seminal event of the Lamb that will be slain. Nothing budgeted it off track. The sermon is entitled Positive Stubbornness. Stubbornness is often seen as maybe a, a negative thing. A wife will talk about her husband and say he's just so stubborn. Stubborn as a mule. Has anyone ever ridden a mule? Some of, a few have. They're stubborn, right? I, had, I rode a mule once. Stubborn. Very stubborn. In fact, I, I rode a mule on a lineage filming trip. We had to go to the top of Mount Hoare in Petra, and we could have walked there, which would have took us three hours, or we could have rode a donkey, which took a lot less and took less effort and cost us $30. So I went with a mule, amen? But that donkey, when I say stubborn as a mule, they, they don't have a reins like a horse. They just have this chain. Maybe it's not the best humanitarian or whatever you want to say. And you pull that donkey's neck this way. Donkey's neck's going this way. Which way does the donkey go? It goes where he feels like. <laughs> like you're physically just yanking his neck and pulling his head. Like, go this way, donkey. Got to kick that thing, pull the head. To just get it to turn a little bit, he'll go where he wants to go. Stubborn as a mule, the phrase comes with good, whatever you want to call it. Other names for stubbornness include dogged existence, intransigent, temerity, pigheadedness. Generally seen as a negative trait. Many marriages break down over stubbornness. You could say a root of stubbornness is pride, but many marriages break down. I saw this uh, billboard that said, this year thousands of men will die from stubbornness. No, we won't. We won't. I read a story of this ship here, SS Admiral Nakhimov. It was sailing with 1,234, one, two, three, four people on board. And on the 31st of August, 1986, it was sailing, I believe it was in the Black Sea. And since they're sailing in the Black Sea, about four hours away, sees a ship in its radar, big freight um, freighter. They radio each other. We're on course. Yeah, yeah, we are. Okay, you move. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll move. You move. Okay, yeah. Two ships see they're on course. It's a tra tragedy. They both see they're on course. This one's full of people. The other one was full of grain. And despite radioing each other, and despite seeing they're both on course, effectively, until the last 500 meters, nothing was done. 
kept sailing towards each other. Kept sailing towards each other. And then right at the end, they're like, whoa, we're going to hit. They quickly tried to go into it. You can't turn big ships around that quick. Ships collided. Lights went out in one. The emergency generators came on in the ship. But two minutes later, the emergency generators go out. And the ship sinks in darkness with 423 people dying. So two captains saw they were about to hit and did nothing. Nothing that would have saved, nothing substantial enough to save lives. Stubbornness is often viewed as a negative trait, but positive stubbornness. Positivity in the face of adversity. People that see the glass half full, not half empty. Positivity in the face of stubbornness is the most positive form of stubbornness. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. I'm not saying he was stubborn, but you could say that he was fixed on where he was going. He didn't change when he saw Israel completely sinning and going against him. When he saw the children of Israel just worshipping idols and worshipping Baal and completely going away from the way they should have gone, when it looked like there's no people actually worth dying for, I'm still going to die. When he comes down to earth, and John 1 verse uh, 11, I believe it is, says, and he came to his own, and his own what? His own received him not. He still says, I'm going to die. Like nothing's going to shake me, or nothing's going to change me, nothing's going to get me off kilter in my mission to save the world. God has given to each one of us a mission. God has given each one of us a responsibility. He's given each one of us a sphere of influence that he wants us to make an impact in. He's given each one of us a calling. A calling. Are we faithful to that calling that God has given to us? Or why are we just wavering around? hoping for something better or something different or something that requires less sacrifice of us. Are we bartering with God? I know you've called me here, but really, can we have a little negotiation here? It's never good to negotiate with God. You don't all, it's rare if ever you turn out better off. This picture here was taken by a drone over the village of North Nibley in England and this village of North Nibley what a name North Nibley in England is the place where one of my favorite reformers was born his name was William Tyndale He's not as well known as your Martin Luther's. He's not as well known as your John Knox's or, or your John Calvin's. But William Tyndale was born in this little village of North Nibley, England. And they've built that monument, that tower there, that big stone structure that towers over the village. It's about 30 meters high in commemoration of the birth of one of their sons. In 2002, he was voted as the 26th most influential Englishman of all time in a BBC poll. But I think that is grossly um, off kilter by the fact he lived 500 years ago and it favors those who were born closer to the time. He grew up there in that village and then he would go on to go and study at Oxford University in 1512 where he would earn his bachelor's at Magdalen Hall. He would later on go over to Cambridge, and there he would study in some of the finest minds in England at the time, and he would become a scholar, he would become a theologian, and implanted in him, I believe by God, was a desire to see the Bible translated into the English language. It is true they had the Bible from John Wycliffe, the morning start of the Reformation, but as I mentioned, that was the Bible from Latin. And the Bible from Latin had what we would say are some theological errors contained therein. Overall, it was good, amen? 
You get a Bible in English that's from the Latin, it's better than no Bible at all, but he wanted a purer text. He wanted a, a text that's translated directly for the, from the Hebrew or from the Greek. He was a scholar. He could speak French, German, Italian, Hebrew, Greek, English, and I forgot on the other two languages. There were seven he could speak. And this is at the age of his mid-twenties. He only died at the age of, I think it was 40. He completed his translation of the New Testament at the age of 29. What did you spend your 20s doing? What are you spending your 20s doing? We often look at these pictures of the reformers and our pioneers of our church, and because their paintings in black and white, we just assume as young people, oh, that's an old person. The vast majority, he's in his 20s translating the New Testament from Greek to English. But it was illegal to translate the Bible from Greek to English back there in England at the time. He actually went, to, he went, he went initially through the channels. And initially he went to go and see Bishop Tunstall and ask him permission to translate the Bible into English. The bishop said, no, you cannot translate the Bible into English. The people do not need the English translation of the Bible. The 1408 Oxford Commission had forbidden the translation of the Bible into the English language. Forbidden. Today we have Bibles at our fingertips. Amen? Churches have them in the back of the pews. You don't even have to bring your Bible to church. Just one there. We have them on our phones, our iPads, our tablets. Internet. Just type in Bible Hub. Boom. Get the Bible. It's there so easily accessible, and yet back then, it wasn't allowed. He gets into a debate one time. He's at a home and they're debating. And he's telling the person, I think we need Bibles in English. And the other person says, no, we don't need the Bibles. And they get into this back and forth and this debate until the other person who, uh, who was a, a Catholic priest or bishop at the time says this, we would be better without God's laws than the Pope's. Meaning if we have to choose between the Bible or the Pope's laws, the Bible, or the Pope's laws, it's better for us to get rid of the Bible and cling on to the Pope's laws and we'd be safer spiritually just there. To which William Tyndale responded what have become these, those that know his, his life, in a sense, famous words. He said, I defy the Pope and all his bishop, all his laws. If God spares my life ere many days, I will cause the boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. What's behind his use of language there? What's behind his, his, his um, what would you say, his analogies or whatever he uses there? I will cause the boy who drives the plow. This is before the Education Act of 18, oh, whatever, four in England. It's before the Education Act of 1898. This is before free education for the masses in England was or, um, mandated by the government. At this time in England, education was the privilege of the aristocrats. Only those who were landowners and, and, and so on, they're the ones who could afford and get an education. But if you were born on someone else's land, if your dad worked the plow on someone else's land, and you grew up and your only outcome of your life could be to help your dad and push the plow behind a cow and grow up to be a plow hand. If that's your only lot in life, you're never going to get an education. Your dad can't afford books. You have no access to libraries, no access to schools. You're going to be illiterate your whole life. You can't add this and this and this. You just take the wages from your master and you live on his land and you work as a plow hand. And he said, I'll cause the boy who drives the plow, an illiterate, uneducated boy who plows the land, to know more of the Bible than you do. I want to make the Bible in a way that an uneducated boy can read it. And it's fascinating if I was to speak in Germany and knew as much about Luther's translation as Wycliffe's, Luther did the same thing in German. 
And just like, sorry, Tyndale, and just like Tyndale helped form the English language, systemize it, Luther did the same thing with German. Tyndale deliberately set about to, 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 to write a Bible which could be accessible to everyone. And to make this completely clear, he used monosyllables. Frequently and in such a dynamic way that they became the drumbeat of English prose. John 1 verse 1. One of the most deep and profound verses in the Bible. And apart from the word beginning, which everyone knows the meaning of, every word in that verse is monosyllabic. One syllable. In the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was don't need to be a genius to understand the words in that verse and yet he puts such profound theological meaning in such a simple way and the word became flesh and dwelt among us boom Right there in those words, verse 1 and verse 14, he packs them at the deepest theological thoughts, and he did it intentionally in a way because he wanted the boy who drives the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. The effect on this was immeasurable, not only in England but across the world. But Tyndale couldn't complete this translation in England, and in 1524, he had to leave England and go to Hamburg, and, and there he went to Hamburg. He also spent some time in Wittenberg. They believe he spent some time in Worms, based on some of the historical names that have been found. And from the time he left England in 1524, he finished his New Testament sometime in 1525 and published it in around 1526. Tyndale's translation includes many phrases that have seeped into the King James, and have seeped into the English language at large. Let me share some of them with you. Knock and it shall be opened unto you comes from Tyndale, a moment in time. Fashion not yourselves to the world. Seek and ye shall find. Ask and it shall be given. Judge not that you be not judged. The word of God that lives in the last forever. The powers that be. How many of us, I mean, just you don't have to be a Christian to use that. Oh, what's happening in the world? Oh, well, you know, the powers that be. The salt of the earth, the law to themselves, it came to pass, filthy lucre, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Live, move, have our being, lick the dust under the sun, signs of the times. Let there be a light, fell flat on his face, the land of the living, pour out one's heart. Flesh pots, go the extra mile, the parting of the ways, let my people go, and an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. All of these are phrases that Tyndale put into his translation of the Bible that have kind of stood the test of time. They made it went their way into the, the King James and they just seeped into language. Tyndale's translation also put in words that theologically as Adventists, we have understand a lot of meaning in these words and they've seeped into our sanctuary and our eschatological understanding of the Bible. Passover. Scapegoat. Atonement, mercy seat. These are put into Tyndale's translation of the Bible. You say, oh, they already had a bunch. No, no, no. They, they, he's given them a purer version of God's word. There were some controversies as well because he put certain words in that were not there before. He put the word elder instead of priest. Huge controversy, as you can understand, what, why there would be a controversy over elder instead of priest. And he used the word congregation instead of church which had huge and does have huge ramifications for your understanding as to what the church is. He used the word congregation. Could it, could, it could mean that where two or three are gathered, there is what? There, there's the Spirit of the Lord. There is his people. But no, the old word was church. No, congregation. This caused huge controversy, and it wasn't just that he was not just translating it into the language, but he was seeking to be um, purer. And you could say the debate got to the point where it was not just over the language. The debate was over the, 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 the words that were used. So that you can actually see a copy of Tyndale's Bible. This is the British Library. You can go there for free. And go and see Tyndale's Bible. Three original versions still remain. And there it sits next to the Magna Carta. One of the three original copies of the Magna Carta. The complete analysis of the authorized version, King James, um, 
was made in 1988, 98. It shows that Tyndale's words account for 84% of the New Testament and 75% of the Old Testament books that he translated. He, Tyndale, is recognized as the un, is mainly the unrecognized translator of the most influential book in the world. Although the authorized King James Bible is ostensibly the work of a learned committee of churchmen, it's mostly cribbed from Tyndale with some reworking of the translation. Have you heard the phrase, copy, cut, paste? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be doing the committee that put the King James together probably a disservice, but you get the point. They weren't coming up with most of it from scratch. If you ever go to London, make sure you see his Monument statue sits outside the Ministry of Defense. There it stands. When he published his Bible, and it starts to seep into England, he's in Europe, it starts to seep into England, it comes on ships. It's interesting that this, this statue here overlooks the River Thames, and it was on the River Thames where the boats would come in with smuggled in, essentially. The Word of God would come smuggled in. And the Bishop of London, wanting to put an end to his work, bought 6,000 copies of his Bible. Every Bible available in the country, yet yeah, buy that one, buy that one, buy one. No doubt using the church funds uh, to do so. He bought 6,000 copies of William Tyndale's Bible. He collected them. Have you ever been to London? St. Paul's Cathedral. He collects them and puts them on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral, and then he burns them. 6,000 copies of William Tyndale's Bible that have just been freshly published on the 11th of February, 1526, attended by 36 bishops, abbots, and friars, and he burns 6,000 brand new William Tyndale Bibles. A blow for the church, a blow for the Reformation, a blow for the cause of God, no. No, you know why? Because 2 Corinthians 3 verse 8 says, we can do nothing against the truth before the truth, amen? What did it do? It got William Tyndale out of debt, praise the Lord. He sold his whole stock right away. He's out of, he's out of debt. You know, normally when you publish a book, you're like, okay, we published a book here. These are our costs. We've got to sell X number to break even. And then after that, we're in a profit. Boom, 6,000, he sold right away. He's out of debt. He enraged, it enraged just the bystanders. It enraged the neutrals, the people that are like, yeah, I'm not quite sure either way. It enraged those people who saw this as a profligate waste of money. Yeah, I might not have been really with William Tyndale, but that is a complete waste of money. And I don't agree with your cause. But furthermore, because they had bought them all at what it's been sold for in the shop, so to speak, and not what it cost. The Bishop of London didn't get a bulk discount, amen. He pays the going rate for all 6,000 copies. It enables William Tyndale to then print a better, higher quality version of the Bible. So yes, 6,000 copies of the Bible did get burned, but God had a way of twisting that and spinning it, so to speak, and turning it around for good. But it wasn't easy to be a William Tyndale or a, William Tyn a, fr a friend of William Tyndale in the 1520s. One of his friends, Richard Bayfield, was just accused of reading Tyndale's writings. He was taken to Smithfield, where in England today is Smithfield Market, sell fish there. And there he was taken to Smithfield, and burned slowly. Likewise, John Firth was taken there and burned slowly. Richard Bayfield wasn't just burned. If you read the story, he was like kept in prison for months, whipped every day, until they said he basically had no flesh left on his body. The burning was just the final act, but he, he died a gruesome, gruesome death. William Tyndale, though, his mission was to present print, sorry, a Bible that will cause a boy who drives the plow to know more of the Scriptures than what? Than you do. Not changing. The last place he lived was Antwerp with Thomas Points. 
He was befriended by a Henry Phillips, who's a Judas-like character. And Henry Phillips pretended he was his friend. People believe he was set up or paid by you know, whoever in England that was trying to catch William Tyndale. And the reason why the king didn't like him, it's kind of an interesting, I don't know what you'd say, just an interesting aspect of history. Because yesterday I talked about Thomas Cranmer, and Thomas Cranmer actually allowed or helped the king to get divorced. Famous martyr. William Tyndale wrote a paper about why the king should not get divorced. They both had disagreements as to what they thought, whatever. And he writes his paper, the king should not get divorced, and it's published. And the king, therefore, has it in for William Tyndale. He has personal issues with this reformer who's not allowing or not encouraging him to get divorced. And he's taken as a prisoner to Vilvoord Castle there in Belgium. I've never, never been to Vilvoord Castle myself. It's in a few pictures, I believe. Pastor Philip Mills was there. He shared a nice photo with me. And there you can find the spot where he's taken as a prisoner. And whilst he was a prisoner, there was an attempted reconciliation between him and the king. In some ways, the king didn't like him. In some ways, he didn't want to kill someone who's so popular or someone who's like this outlaw that's on the run. And, and they wanted him on their side in some way. And they tried to get a reconciliation with Tyndale and with the king and to come back to England. And you can kind of imagine what they would say, come back to England, come back to England. And if you've been out of your country for 12 years at this point, 12 years out of your country, you have some degree of nostalgia. You know, Americans go overseas, they have nostalgia. They want to get back to their McDonald's. Amen. Or whatever you want to get back for. Maybe not you. You want to get back to your home country. Eat your home food. William Tyndale, he's over there eating pastries in Europe. He wants to get back to England and have some good old fish and chips. He wants to get back there and have life in his home country and see his friends and come back to England. And he's like, well, if I come back, will the king allow the Bible to be translated? We can't guarantee that, but we'll work on it. Come back. Will the king, can't guarantee, but Come. And despite promises, he would not return to England unless the king sanctioned the Bible in the English language. Principle, what do we learn from him? His legacy, his life, his mission is more important than life itself. He said, no, I've got a reason. There's a purpose to my existence. God has called me to translate the Bible, and that is why I'm here. And I will not sacrifice the purpose of my life. I will not sacrifice my calling for some safety or just to go back home. The purpose of my life is bigger than my life. And he was taken to this spot and strangled to death. But I don't know how. They got the strangling messed up and they couldn't strangle him. So they burned him. His monument in London reads this word, first translator of the New Testament into English from the Greek. Born 1484, died a martyr in Vilvoord in Belgium, 15, was that 36? His last words, his last words of William Tinder were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. This is King Henry VIII. Lord, open the eyes of King Henry VIII, who won't allow the translation of the Bible. Within a year or so afterwards, a Bible was placed in every parish church by the king's command. Still doesn't make King Henry VIII uh, a decent character. But it showed some change in his heart or whatever after he dies. It was Tertullian who said the blood of Christians is seed for the gospel. In John 12, Jesus talking about his own death said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth what? Much fruit. If it dies, it brings forth much fruit. It was Job who said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I was reading this story, fascinating story. Margaret Wilson, 18 years old. 18 years old. She was part of the Scottish Covenanters. 
And at 18 years old, she refuses to take this vow that goes against her conscience and against the Bible. And at 18 years old, she gets tied to a stake in the, in, in the Bay of Firth in Scotland. What a gruesome way to die. We'll tie you to a stake and you can just watch the tide come in up to your chest and up to your chin and slowly drown. But she refused to utter the words that they asked her to utter and thus she paid for it with her life. It's Isaiah 50 verse 7 that says, I have set my face like a what? One of the favorite places I filmed, and actually it's in this book actually, a chapter on her, was the house of Marie Durand. The reason I like this story is because, you know, often people say, who's your favorite reformer? Oh, I like Martin Luther. Well, he's great. Or I like William Tyndale. He's one of my favorites. Or I like John Wycliffe, Morningstar of the Reformation. Or I like Hugh Latimer. All of these people that most of us like as our favorite reformers, if we even have one, they're scholars, they're theologians, they're academics. They work for the University of Oxford or Wittenberg or Cambridge. They were the top leading minds in the world of the day. And praise God, he used those men to sway the course of Earth's history. But I like the story of Marie Durand. Because she wasn't famous and probably half of you have never even heard of her. She wasn't a scholar. She wasn't a theologian. She wasn't an academic. She wasn't a pastor. She was locked up in prison. Notice there you see on the picture, prisoner. She lived from the top part of the picture, which you can't see. I should have taken a better picture. This is her brother, Pierre Durand. And Pierre Durand went from 1700 to 1732. He died at the age of 32. Marie Durand, though, is 1715 to 1776. At that time in France, worship services had to be held in secret. They called them the assemblies in the desert. Her father was locked up and held in prison for many years and died at the age of 92, only two years after he was released from prison. Her brother was taken to prison and sentenced to death. As you see on the screen, he was sentenced to death. He was a pastor. And when he took the call to be a pastor, he basically sentenced the rest of his family to either prison or death. You know, in some families today, it's still seen as an honor to have a child who's a pastor. Oh, my son's a pastor. Not all families, because academia's hit Adventism, amen? Not academia, I mean like, what should I say? That's the wrong word. Uh, the desire for your kids to be rich. And in some families, you'd rather have your kid be a doctor or a dentist than you would a pastor. And that's just the reality. But, imagine if your son or your or your child takes a call to be a minister and in taking that call to be a pastor and announces at the family table, I'm going to be a pastor. You know that as those words are uttered, your whole family is on the run. There's no celebrations, there's no graduation, there's no ordinations. The beautiful ordination service here a few days ago. There's no big celebration of ordination. No, no, no. When your son takes a call to be a pastor, that's it for the family. No family gatherings anymore. No, 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 no retreats, no nothing. He's on the run. We're on the run. That was life like back then. Matthew comes home and says, the Lord's called me to be a pastor. Mm. Dad's in prison. He's taken to prison. The brother was sentenced to death. And now Marie's 18 years old. And in those days in, the, in, in society, you couldn't be a single woman. You couldn't just be like, oh, I'm just going to be a single woman. I've got my education. Let me go rent a house and get a job. You could not be a single woman. You either lived in your father's home or your husband's home. There was no middle ground. Just wasn't possible to just go out and have a career and have a job and, and get a rent and, and just be a woman. No, 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 no. You had lived with your father or you lived with your husband. And now her father's been arrested and taken away. Her brother's gone and she can't be a burden to him while he's trying to run through the woods and escape. And so she gets married to Matthew Sayre, who was in his 40s. No 18-year-old wants to marry a man in their 40s. 
but it was a marriage of necessity, you'd say. Her husband got arrested and sent to prison for 20 years, and now she gets arrested. And, and his story is, and maybe this is an imagination, um, imaginative look into history, but when you look at the prison records, she doesn't have on the prison records her married name, Marie Serre. The prison records record her maiden name, Marie Durand. Not her married name, her maiden name. And it makes you wonder, why did she put her maiden name down and not her married name? And this is just kind of an imaginative look into history, so there's no record to this, but it's possible that when they were searching for her, they, they're not looking for Marie Say because they don't know, they're looking for a Marie Durand. And in an imaginative illustration of history, you can imagine them opening the door into the family home, and they walk in and they say, is Marie Durand here? There's no facial recognition, there's no passports or nothing, they don't know what she looks like. Is Marie Durand here? And the husband looks across the table and gives her the eye. There's no woman who exists called Marie Durand. Remember your new name. And she looks back and says, I am she. I will not hide under the illusion of being wise as a serpent. I'm proud of my brother. I am Marie Durand. She's taken to prison, and there she's taken to prison. The, I mean, this was during the time of the Edict of Nantes, um, which was revoked, where you couldn't be a Protestant in the country, as I was mentioning. The faithful were just, you were just declared. Imagine if you're all Catholics, new converts. You have to attend Mass and have their children baptized. Pastors have to account of going to exile. Church buildings were torn down, and eight to 900,000 Huguenots fleed the country. Brain drain from France. You know that the Swiss watch industry is the Huguenots from France who relocated there. She's taken to this place, this tower. It's a beautiful tower. We went there to film. Stunning architectural design. And there we went into this tower where she was taken, the Tower of Constance, the Tour de Constance. And there she was taken to this room. Actually, this is the room below. The room she was taken was the room above. And she was in this room at the age of 18. A simple recantation was all that was needed. Her niece, Anne, in Geneva, recanted and married a rich old Catholic and lived peacefully, maybe not with her conscience, but at least with her life. Marie de Ron's taken to this place at the age of 18. The story of Margaret Wilson's powerful. She's an 18-year-old girl, and she's tied to a stake in the, in the Scottish um, harbor. And the waves come and drown her, and we say, praise God for her fortitude. But at the age of 18, Marie's taken to this prison, and she doesn't have the opportunity to die a heroic death as a martyr. She's taken to this room, and there she is. And in this room, France, southern France gets cold in the winter. There's snow on the ground. It gets boiling hot in the summer. Humidity, and there they are in this room. No escaping this room. No showers in the room. Just a bucket, maybe. No toilet, just a bucket. And the same hole that they would pour the bucket of waste down would be the same hole that the food they had to eat would get thrown up through. And there she is in this room, from the age of 18, all the way through her 20s. Then all the way through her 30s. You know, they say your 20s, your 30s, well, every, every decade as you get older, you say it's the best decade of your life. But your 20s are a good decade. They're a good decade. She lives her whole 20s in that stone room. She then lives her whole 30s in that stone room. She lives her whole 40s in that stone room. Every day or week, and historians vary, or, or people vary as to how often, but regularly someone would come and say, will you recant? No, nah, not today. 20s, 30s, 40s, finally at the age of 56, 56, 38 years after going in there, she gets released. And you could find around that hole, there's stone around the hole, and there's this cover. 
you can't quite see it properly because they put a glass over it, but etched there, and they believe it was with a knitting needle. Some people say they don't know exactly if it was her that did it, but maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but it, 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 it summarizes the sentiment of the women who were collectively there, and they're around that uh, thing. She's engraved the French word register. You say in French, register, which is now the modern French word of resister which is the English word of resist, resist. It's one thing to die as a martyr at the age of 18. It's another thing to stay in prison for 38 years. 38 years and just be like, I'm not changing my mind. I'm not changing my mind. And you're only there because your brother was a pastor. That's the only reason. Obviously, she's a Protestant too. I have set my face like a flint, and I shall not be moved. The greatest person who set their face like a flint is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The Bible says the lamb slain from the what? Foundation of the world. And while he's hanging there on the cross, the last temptations of Jesus were came to him in the words of the passers-by, in the words of the chief priests and rulers. And they came to Jesus and they said, if you are the son of God, then what? Come down from the cross. If you are the king of Israel, come down from the cross and we will believe. He's slain from the foundation of the world. He's accepted the penalty of death at the very beginning and all through the 4,000 years of Old Testament history. His eyes are fixed on that one point that will deliver humanity and save the world. And he gets on the cross and the final temptation, come down, come down, come down. And Jesus says, no, I'll stay on the cross. I'm staying on the cross to see the plan of salvation through that today you and I can have salvation. And Jesus looks to us in a sense and says, will you have that same fixed mindset? Will you have that same determination? Will you have that same devotion to me that I had for you? Our sacred history is filled with people that, that, that lived honorable lives. But ultimately, it's the life of Jesus who inspires us to live for him from day to day. May we understand what our life mission is like William Tyndale. May we have a sense of being fixed to our purpose like Marie Durand. But may we ultimately accept Jesus' salvation for us and not be moved, not be swayed, that our face is set. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we bow our heads, we know that we're weak people. As we bow our heads, Lord, we know that we, we just lack oftentimes firmness. Sometimes we're so easily shaken. Lord, give us a sense of purpose that we don't organically have. Give us a sense of stubbornness in divine things that we were not born with, that we don't possess ourselves. And give us, Lord, a firmness in our determination to follow you. It's not something we do of ourselves. It's not something we muster up just by being strong is something we ultimately do by surrendering to you. Lord, abide in us. May we abide in you. And may we be found faithful, Lord, in spite of the attempts of the enemy to get us off track. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.